So the story that Mary began for us is a story with which many of us are familiar. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I wonder sometimes why in the world this story captivates us so much. I mean, it's violent, and it's got these unwieldy names. Uh, maybe the reason we like it is because we spent so much time learning how to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that uh, once we learn it, we're never letting go. But it's got this way of kind of captivating us because many of us, if you grew up in church circles, you heard this story, and once you hear it, once you learn it, it's really rather difficult to forget it. And I don't know if that's largely because Veggie Tales. <laughs> they did a marvelous job in de-escalating the violence and giving us the names Rack, Shack, and Benny, <laughs> which are just a lot easier to pronounce. I don't know if it's because some of us of a certain vintage uh, heard Louis Armstrong singing the song of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Oh, you see, boys, thrown in the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach. It's hard to forget that once you hear it. <laughs> And um, except for the lyrics, I can forget lyrics to anything. Um, maybe we heard Louis Armstrong. It's his birthday, by the way. And uh, maybe that's what makes it so. Or maybe some of you are Johnny Cash fans. You know, he had a great song called The Fourth Man in the Fiery Furnace. And he would dedicate it to people who were in confined spaces as he visited nursing homes and, and prisons and places like that. So maybe, maybe that's what kind of captivates our imagination, but something about this story is just hard to let go of, and there are a number of ways that we can hear the story. I'm going to finish the story that Mary started for us, and as we listen to it today, I'm going to invite you to hear it in a specific way, that Shadrach Meshach and Abednego were facing a persistent question that arises again and again in the Hebrew Bible, in the New Testament as well. And that is the question of how do we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Listen for the word of God. At this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drums, and the entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your God. They do not worship the golden statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. And so they brought those men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, that you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drum, and the entire musical ensemble, to fall down and worship the statue that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to, prevent, to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let God deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. 
He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hat, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the blazing fire. And because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the furnace, blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men we threw and bound into the fire? And they answered, O king, true, true, O king, he replied. But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the uh, governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their tunics were not harmed. And not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the gods of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. May God add blessings to the reading and the hearing of the word. Will you pray with me? God of grace, as we hear this compelling story, as we imagine the foolishness of Nebuchadnezzar and the abuse of power, and as we hear the heroism of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Give us eyes to see what you're doing in our world today and give us ears to hear our call to be faithful. Amen. So I invited you to listen to that story as a way of addressing this persistent question throughout the scriptures. How do we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Because for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it would have been an entirely different situation had they still been in Judah, where they were from. We read in an earlier portion of Daniel that when Nebuchadnezzar's army defeated uh, Judah and the capital city of Jerusalem, they sent the palace master in to gather up some of the brightest, most promising young men in Jerusalem and bring them back into Babylon to be trained to be leaders. So they were recognizing this leadership quality. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they grew up there in Jerusalem, and they never would have faced this trial there. Because when you grow up in Jerusalem, you have this shared language about faith. You have a shared understanding of who God is and how God calls us to live. In Jerusalem, they knew the, the Ten Commandments. They knew that we don't make graven images. They knew that there's one God and only one God. They knew they don't bow down uh, in the face of a, a giant statue. They, there was just this kind of common sense that's shared in one's home turf and in one's home faith. And there they knew what God required of them. But now they're lifted out of Judah and plunged down into a very different context with a different set of gods and a different way of understanding power and, and, and faithfulness. And, and, and so they're facing the question, how do we continue to maintain our faithfulness in a foreign land? It's a question that gets raised and answered differently 
throughout the scriptures. In fact, one of the predecessor stories that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have learned as children was the story of Joseph. And Joseph had an interesting way of answering that question. Because you remember the story of Joseph. It sounds very much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, frankly. Uh, because Joseph was sold into slavery and through a bunch of uh, uh, bad circumstances ended up living in the Egyptian empire far away from home and like Daniel he was elevated to be the second most powerful person in the foreign empire and Joseph's answer to the question of how you maintain faithfulness living in the foreign land is well when in Egypt, walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> don't you wish we could have just broken out and all of us sung that song? I just don't know enough of it. Walk like an Egyptian. Joseph looked like an Egyptian. He cut his hair like an Egyptian. He married an Egyptian. And did you know that for Egyptians, here's something the scriptures tell us about them. For the Egyptians, it's an abomination to eat with Jews. Can you believe that? For the Egyptian. That tells us two things. Number one, abominations are cultural. Hello? Abominations are cultural and are challengeable. Just because you see the word abomination in the scriptures doesn't mean, ah! It can mean something that's cultural and wrong. So, the Egyptians considered an abomination to eat with the Jews. And the second thing that tells us is Joseph was all in on being an Egyptian because when it came dinner time, his brothers ate in that room and he ate in this room. So Joseph's answer to the question of how you maintain your faithfulness is you can be faithful in Egypt, just be a really faithful Egyptian. You can be faithful in Babylon, just be a really faithful Babylon. One of the prophets even said, in the city where you are, he was talking to deportees who had been taken out of Israel and into uh, Assyria. In the city where you are, pray for the city where you are because your situation and their situation are bound up together. So one of the answers to the question of how we maintain faithfulness in a foreign land is to be a really good Egyptian. Be a good Babylonian. Maintain your faithfulness in that culture, in that language, wearing that dress, following their abominations, being much like them. Joseph had laid down that answer earlier in the story. And to some extent, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already followed Joseph's method of going along to get along. Because frankly, their names are not really Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the names that the palace master gave them because he thought they were easier to pronounce <laughs> than their real names. Azariah. I don't know the real names. I have to go look on a piece of paper and tell you what their real names are. Sorry. It's one of those things that I just don't have room in my brain to learn. Their names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those were the names they were called in Judah. They were renamed. Now, this is traumatic, right? This is, this is an incredible conformity. If you read slave journals about what happened to the identity and story of someone when they were taken out of their land and renamed as they became uh, imprisoned in another land, in those slave journals, naming, losing one's name and taking on a new name is an identity switch that cuts to the very core of someone's being. If you talk to someone who is struggling with their own identity and maybe they don't feel like they fit within the binary categories that we have in the U.S. and they ask you, please call me by this name, then we should listen. Listen for how important that identity is. Don't push back and say, well, your mama named your friend. I'm calling your friend. You listen to their story because in that name is their life. So can you imagine the price that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have already paid by losing their names and taking on an alien name for themselves. They've already seen how Joseph's method works, and to some extent, they followed it. 
But now they are confronted with something where they're ready to draw a line in the sand and say, I can conform to this, I can negotiate to that, I can give a little bit on this, but this is too far. And that's when King Nebuchadnezzar, probably in that same fiery furnace, smelted this large golden statue. This, this, this idol of conceit and set it up and imitated, imitated the glory of heaven by saying, oh, when you hear the trumpets play and the trigon, whatever exactly that is, a three-sided instrument, when you hear the drums, when you hear the musicians play, everyone will bow down. Oh, it sounds, like Mary said, it sounds like something out of the book of Revelation where all the heavenly hosts are casting off their crowns and bowing down, and it's all a conceit because it's all in favor of wealth and power. You understand? That's what this idol is. Idols are nothing in themselves. They're projections of those of us who make them. And this is a projection of wealth and power and Nebuchadnezzar is demanding that everybody, when they hear the sounds, bow down and worship wealth and power. And that's too far. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego not only said no, but did you hear the heroic words they said? They said, if our God is able to deliver us from the fire, then let God do that. And if God is not willing or able to do that, we still refuse to bow down to your golden idol. That's heroism. So what happens when we hear the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as a hero story. Well, it reminds us that we are forever negotiating with our own culture. Our own culture, which is built on principles very unlike the Christian church. The Christian church built on the principle of turning the other cheek and we have a culture so inextricably dedicated to violence. The Christian church, the way of Christ, is built on giving away all that we have and trusting that God will provide for us. And we live in a culture that thinks that's lunacy, right? So you and I, every day, we're constantly negotiating with, in, in, in what respects can we go along to get along? In what respects do we need to act like an Egyptian? Do what, in what respects do we have to pay the piper? And where is that line? where we have to look at King Nebuchadnezzar and say, absolutely not. We cannot do this and keep our identity. We cannot do this and keep our integrity. Where is that line? Where is that place, my friends, where you and I are called to live heroically in the world? and to discern that the time for conforming is over and the time to stand up and be different and be cast aside as, 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 as lunatics, to be thrown into some kind of fiery furnace, to, to risk everything we have. Where is that line where the only way we can maintain our identity, our integrity, is to say no? When we sing about heroes and villains throughout the summer, that's the life to which we're being invited. May God give us the strength and the courage to live that heroic life. Amen.